Right. Good morning, everyone. Well, I guess it's not morning anymore. Uh, so I'll, um, also, uh, I always like to uh, teach people some Italian. So um, a CH in Italian is K, so uh, it's actually Alessandro Chiesa. Um, <clears throat> OK, so today I have, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about something I'm uh, uh, quite excited about, which is uh, cryptographic proofs. OK, so this is going to be a technical talk. And uh, I have as my goal, uh, for those of you here, to when you walk away later today, to understand some, something about cryptographic proofs that are uh, highly efficient. Okay, there's called succinct arguments. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so so let me tell you about uh, what are succinct arguments. And uh, in order to tell you about what are succinct arguments, I have to first tell you about what are proofs of computational integrity. Okay. So, in a proof, you have these two parties that are called a prover and a verifier, okay? And the prover has, uh, uh, knows certain things. It knows a function, an output, and an input, okay? And the verifier knows just the function and the output. And the prover would like to convince the verifier that he knows an input x that makes the function f output y, okay? So, does anybody have any suggestions on what the prover could do to convince the verifier that this is the case? I was actually, I was, it was not a rhetorical question. You can give it x, right? So you can just send a string, okay? Uh, for example, x, okay? And the verifier can just go ahead and, you know, so run the computation uh, itself, right? Now, more generally, uh, we'll see in a moment, the prover may actually decide to do something else other than sending x. But the key point is that, you know, when you suggested, why don't you give the verifier X, it was because that seemed like a good way to, make the, to convince the verifier. What does good way mean? So when we talk about proof systems, we have these abstract properties in mind that, that uh, sort of capture formally what we mean by proof. One of them is called completeness, that says that if the prover is saying the truth, that says there is an X that uh, uh, makes F output Y, then the prover should be able to convince the verifier. So, for example, the prover could literally go ahead and say, here's X, okay? And if he's saying the truth, he will, maim, he will make the verifier, you know, be convinced, okay? Um, so, so, formally, that's how you would write it. But that's not good enough, right? So, you also need the other side, which is called soundness, okay? If the theorem is false, then I mean, there is no X that makes uh, Y equals uh, F of X, then you want it to be the case, the verifier cannot be fooled. So for example, in the simple case where the verifier is just going to take whatever the prover gives him and stick it into F and check himself, if there is no X that makes F output Y, then clearly, no matter what the prover sends, he's not going to be able to make the verifier accept. Does that make sense, right? Now, clearly, sending X explicitly is just one particular way to achieve these two sides, completeness and soundness of a proof, okay? So a proof, you know, is a, a, a proof because it has these two sides, okay? Um, <clears throat> clearly, achieving either of these properties on its own would be trivial, right? So if you want to just make the verifier always convinced, let him always say yes. If you want the verifier never be fooled, let him always answer no. Right? What you want is the verifier to kind of discriminate correctly between truthhoods and falsehoods, okay? All right, so the X, sending X is a pretty reasonable way to uh, uh, sort of prove the statement. It says, you know, here it is. However, today I want to tell you about why, you know, sending X sort of uh, in a very, uh, in a sort of in this uh, straightforward manner may not be such a um, useful thing to do. Specifically, X itself may be large, okay? It may, be, it may take a lot of bandwidth to just send X. X may be like, I don't know, big database, okay? Or maybe lots of data that F is inspecting to produce some final output. You could think about, for example, F as a training algorithm, okay? On a large piece of data to produce a classifier. And also, uh, the poor verifier uh, has to actually re-execute the computation natively, okay? And so it has to run in time that it, whatever time it takes to compute y, you know, uh, by running f of x, verifier has to sort of incur that cost. 
You might wonder, okay, what does all this have to do with blockchains, okay? Can anybody maybe give an example where sort of naively re-executing computations is something that is uh, inconvenient in the blockchain world? Again, that was a question. Maybe somebody wants to answer. I don't hear very well. Uh, right, so for example, let's take a simple example in a smart contract system like Ethereum, okay? When you send a transaction, okay, it says, hey, you know, I've run this contract call, here's the output, you know, please validate it, okay? And now everybody else in the world is like, you know, I don't trust you, so I should probably rerun the computation to make sure, right? And because everybody else is rerunning the computation, you have things like gas, for example, right? You don't want users to just run denial of service attacks by just saying, here's a very expensive computation, it's offline, please re-execute it, okay? You actually have to pay for your own computation. So, in general, this idea that you can have maybe proofs of computational integrity that are more efficient than naive re-execution has a very tight connection to uh, what we've been talking about today. So this peer-to-peer -peer systems where somebody, so in the privacy of their own home, has done a computation and then wants to claim a result for the rest of the world. And now you don't want each person, each validator in the rest of the world to have to re-execute the computation from scratch in order to be convinced. So cryptographic proofs play a role here because you want to find a um, sort of more uh, efficient methods to verify the results of computation. Does that make sense? Okay. So, <clears throat> succinct proofs uh, encapsulate a, a sort of uh, a, this um, more, more, efficient, more efficient goals, okay? So you would like to say that the proof itself is not so big, doesn't have to be you know, as big as X, and the time to check the proof doesn't have to you know, merely be re-executing the original computation. What you like to do is for the proof to be so-called succinct, so like you know, short, for example, you could require uh, that the number of bits in the proof is not order of x, but say some you know, uh, exponentially smaller than the running time of the computation, okay, some polylog in t. And similarly, you can also ask that the time to check the proof is so-called succinct, and it's short. It, it, it doesn't grow linearly in t, but you know, grows exponentially you know, sort of slower, like in a, some, poly, some uh, uh, like log t, okay? So this notion of uh, cryptographic proofs uh, that uh, f for long computations that can be efficiently verified was actually uh, introduced in the 90s, uh, among others also by Silvio Micali, who had like a beautiful paper precisely on this subject in the 90s, who pr provided the first construction that achieves these properties. And what I wanted to do today was to uh, attempt to tell you a little bit about where do proofs like these come from. It sounds like such a magical property that you can check a computation without actually re-executing it yourself. Okay? By the way, the title of the talk was succinct arguments, whereas the title of this particular slide says succinct proofs. So, you know, what's the difference? Uh, so, again, it's a technical talk, so I want to, you know, attempt to explain some concepts. There is a difference. It turns out that when you ask, you know, such a strong efficiency property like succinct proofs and succinct verification, we cannot, it is actually impossible to achieve as is, okay? We have to make a compromise somewhere, okay? And the compromise is that we're gonna say that this is what we, in cryptography we call arguments, essentially the soundness condition of the proof system is going to hold provided the adversary doesn't have, say, an exponential amount of resources, okay? Essentially, it could be the case that false statements have proofs, except that they're very hard to find, okay? Maybe it might require inverting a cryptographic hash function. So it's not that it's literally a proof, it's an argument, okay? So the soundness condition will re rely on some cryptography. Is that a problem? No, I mean, we rely on cryptography all the time. You know, you have to make sure you rely on good cryptography, okay? So. If there are false proofs, but they're hard to find, that's okay, right? So we rely all the time on encryption. Does it, does it mean it's perfectly secure? No, it just says that you cannot break it unless you bring to the table an exponential amount of resources. Who has an exponential amount of resources? Nobody, right? Now with this relaxation, which one can actually prove is necessary, 
we actually have a, a feasible goal. And it turns out that actually you know, it is possible to achieve. So the notion of succinct arguments uh, is what I want to talk about today. OK? Are we together? I don't, unfortunately, I cannot see you. I don't know whether like, uh, so you look confused. You have question marks on your head or. Uh, oh, wait, cool. I should have brought uh, like a baseball hat or something. Uh, <laughs> OK. Um, so for the rest of today, I want to attempt to tell you a little bit about what has been happening, um, not just recently, but actually over the past uh, uh, 10, 20 years, in the sort of in the area of, of uh, succinct arguments. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so this is sort of the picture for a succinct argument looks more like this. The prover is the one that is sort of big and fat. He has to do the computation to figure out the result and more. He also also produce the proof. But the verification is uh, cheap, right? And you know, crucially. <clears throat> oh, by the way, so if uh, if you've seen the term snark or snarks in, uh, in popular media, this is what I'm talking about today. It stands for succinct non-interactive arguments. So I'm talking about succinct arguments that are non-interactive because they're just one message. So there have been you know many beautiful and efficient constructions in the last few years of these objects, and because a, sort of the work of generating a proof can be done you know, once and for all and can be checked by multiple uh, parties, okay? You can take a proof, stash it in a transaction, and a transaction gets validated by many people cheaply and uh, sort of succinctly, right? These types of uh, very attractive efficiency properties have actually led to uh, some uh, uh, sort of real-world deployments. So, for example, Zcash today uses, uh, among other things, uh, I mean, it's a protocol, but inside the protocol at some point there is, you know, a very important secret sauce, and that is a snarg. Okay. And uh, also, more recently, actually last year, I you know actually co-founded another company called Starkware that sort of precisely revolves around uh, a, a sort of exploring exciting applications of uh, a, um, not just to privacy but to scalability uh, brought about to by so snarks. Okay. Now I mentioned zero knowledge a few times. Today's we're not going to talk about it again. Uh, when you have this type of cryptographic proofs. You can use them for good things, either because they're very efficient or because they're private or because of both reasons, okay? You want them to be highly efficient and private, okay? So today, I'm not going to focus on the uh, privacy aspects of these proofs. I specifically really want to tell you about how on earth could it be that the proof could be so small and easy to verify, okay? All right. So actually, it turns out that as described so far, what I what is on the board on the board okay, on the slides uh, is uh, still impossible to achieve. Um, what you actually need is a little bit extra help. It is called a setup. Essentially, at the beginning of time, someone, an algorithm, you know, receives some randomness and produces some system parameters. These are parameters that are used by the prover to generate proofs, okay, and by all verifiers to check proofs. Okay, you can think about it as uh, you know just some set of uh, uh, numbers or strings that are important you know to interpret what a proof means you know when you check it. Okay, and so this is uh, a, a, a something I want to focus on because when you think about deploying this type of uh, cryptographic primitives in peer-to-peer -peer systems, uh, a question comes up of sort of uh, who runs. Uh, this, uh, um, who produces the system parameters, okay? And focusing on this brings about a, uh, sort of a, the goal that I want to talk about today of transparent succinct arguments, okay? So what I'll try to explain right now. So who samples the parameters, okay? It could be a person. You can just say, just look, that guy samples it, okay? Uh, you know, he does it, produces the parameters, and then the system benefits from that. Um, what is the problem with asking somebody to sample the parameters? He could cheat. Excuse me? He could cheat, for example. Or he could just say, yeah, I sample the parameters, but, you know, let me, maybe I'll remember about how I sample them, and maybe I can uh, sort of uh, uh, do something bad. It turns out it's actually the case. For, known, for many known constructions of snarks, if you are the person that sampled the parameters, and kind of you know the secret randomness that was involved to produce the parameters, you can actually abuse the knowledge of that randomness to actually f 
forge false proofs. I say, well, but I, you know, I deleted my randomness. Well, you know, I don't believe you, right? Maybe, maybe you really did want to cheat, okay? So, how do we use these things in the real world? It seems like it might be very difficult in a peer-to-peer -peer system to find a single person we can trust to sample the parameters and forget sort of this uh, a, 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 a randomness that was used to generate parameters. Now, in the real world, what uh, um, so we've done, both within academia and eventually in industry, is to find you know, strong, let's call them mitigations. Essentially, what you want to do is you want to bring together a group of people, six, 10, 20, maybe 100 people, okay? that are going to conduct a so-called cryptographic ceremony. That, and they're jointly going to satisfy, sample the parameters in such a way that if at least one of these people is honest, then all of the parameters that are generated, I mean, the parameters that are generated are sec sort of securely sampled, okay? So you have this multi-party computation that you would have to corrupt everybody, okay? So in the real world, um, you could realize this by, you know, bringing in different stakeholders, uh, people with different ideological opinions, so that it becomes sort of unthinkable for all these people to jointly collude, you know, to take down the system. It turns out that these things uh, have been done in the real world, and uh, I think uh, it is a pretty reasonable, uh, uh, from a security standpoint, it's a pretty reasonable thing to do in the real world. What is, um, in my mind, what is the major drawback of these types of uh, approaches is sort of uh, operational costs, okay? So organizing and orchestrating a cryptographic ceremony requires time and effort. You have to do it well. If you don't do it well, it's insecure, right? And so if we sort of imagine a future where these cryptographic proofs are part of many systems, they provide scalability in many settings, maybe they're powering all kinds of uh, a, 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 a services where offline lots of complicated things happen and only proofs are then posted later, we cannot sort of go around doing cryptographic ceremonies every time there is some new interesting application cryptographic proofs. We want to be able to sort of nimbly deploy these types of proofs in all kinds of applications. So, at the same time, I said that system parameters are kind of important. Like, we need them, otherwise these objects don't exist. So what's the next best thing that we could try to do? So, in, uh, in my own research group, and also in my, uh, sort of, uh, in the latest startup that I co-founded, I have been studying a lot this notion of so-called transparent snarks, okay? These are snarks where the system parameters have no structure. Essentially, all you rely on is knowledge of sufficient amount of public randomness, okay? And while from a theoretical perspective, assuming that everybody agrees on some string is random, is a system parameter, it is qualitatively much harder to corrupt because there's many places where you can find random looking things, you know, here's one, right? You just take pi, right? And you read enough digits of it. And, you know, pi, it, it, believing that pi was designed such that, you know, at some point in 2018, 2019, people could forge false proofs for snarks, that seems, you know, a bit extreme, right? So pi existed before uh, we thought all of these notions. So using something like that, it's a sort of pretty reasonable heuristic in practice. Okay, so even though technically there's a parameter, there are system parameters using a, a, a sort of merely relying on public randomness is a pretty good compromise in practice. So essentially what I'm going to say is that from, if we look forward into, uh, if we believe, and I, I think many of us do, and uh, that cryptographic proofs are going to play an important role in uh, scalability and privacy going forward in these peer-to-peer systems, it's important to uh, uh, sort of develop good constructions of transparent snarks. By the way, what does transparent mean? It means that somehow there is no sort of secrets in the, um, in the system parameters, okay? It's kind of the randomness that was used is what is used in the end. You cannot, there's, there's no trapdoors, you, you know about it. Okay, so <clears throat> these things, these type of constructions are not deployed yet. But thanks to uh, a, a, a recent exciting developments inside academia and uh, also this uh, a, a startup that I mentioned, uh, I think we're going to see them deployed already starting uh, uh, next year. And I want to tell you about 
a sort of being, using pictures, where do transparent snarks come from? Okay? Well, that's kind of the plan for the next 23 minutes. Or, I mean, maybe I will finish even before then. Okay? So let's take a breather. Okay? So we talked about uh, succinct arguments. So far, succinct arguments are about sort of proofs that are short and easy to verify. And then I said, you know, we need system parameters. I said, you know, system parameters are a bit inconvenient in peer-to-peer -peer systems. So now we're going to focus on a you know, very specific type of uh, succinct arguments, the transparent ones. Okay? Those are the ones that are easiest to deploy. Okay? They have the nicest type of setup. Okay? And now I want to tell you where these things come from. Okay. So <clears throat> we go back to the 90s. Many good things happened in the 90s where uh, actually at UC Berkeley, um, so several graduate students introduced uh, uh, the notion of probabilistically shackable proofs. Okay, I want to tell you what this notion is. It's a beautiful notion. Uh, it's not a cryptographic notion. It's a, sort of just like, a, like a, a thing that exists in mathematics. Okay? And it is also about proofs, except that it has a sort of structurally looks a bit different. Okay? So let's again focus on a prover that has a particular computational statement that it wants to make, and it produces a proof. Now, before, um, we thought a proof as just x. Now let's imagine that the prover doesn't write down x, but somehow encodes x in some way. From a technical perspective, underneath it all, there is some sort of error correcting codes with very special properties, but essentially you take your x, and you encode it in some way, and you write it down. So here it is, it's written down. After the prover writes this kind of encoded X, um, the verifier comes along and it says, I want to check it, okay? So instead of looking at the entire proof, the verifier is going to check the statement by only sampling a few locations of the proof. That's why these things are called probabilistically checkable proofs. They're proofs that can be probabilistically checked. So how does it work? The Verifier, you know, produces some queries. How many? Well, think three, like a very small number. Okay. It gets back the answers and it says, okay, the answer, you know, I, I looked up uh, location seven, location 13, location, uh, I don't know, 43. I got back the answers. You know, these are the answers. I now decide whether to accept or reject. And now here's a, 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 a beautiful fact. It turns out that Every computation is such that you can produce a proof of this form. It's a highly non-trivial fact. It turns out, this is true, there's, there's, uh, there's no cryptography or anything. It's a fact, sort of, let's call it of nature, of mathematics, that every computation for every f and, you know, candidate output y, it is possible to write down a proof. It's not a small proof. It has size poly t. Okay, it's at least as long as the original computation, in fact, longer than that, such that it has all this redundant information within it in such a way that even if you look at a small number of locations, you actually can check, say, with 50% probability, whether the, the, like if the statement was false, you can catch it with 50% probability. So, oh, I don't like 50%, I want to make it smaller. Okay, ask, I don't know, 100 queries or 200. Then your probability goes down exponentially. If you think about it, that's pretty impressive because regular computations, they're pretty brittle, right? You, if, if you consider, for example, a computer, it goes you know, cycle after cycle after cycle and instruction after another. If only one instruction is incorrect, right? The entire computation, the result could just be incorrect. So if somebody were, for example, to write down the transcript of computation, the fact that you sample a few places doesn't mean anything. The error could just be one location out of t. So the fact that you can sample, say, three locations out of something, an object of size t, and have 50% confidence of catching a mistake is incredible. Okay? And, okay, I'm not going to open up where this object comes from. I'm just going to say this object exists. Okay? And transparent snarks are a way to build on these objects to produce cryptographic proofs. 
So the question is, well, isn't this thing already a snark? Right? I mean, it feels pretty similar to what we're trying to achieve. What's there to do? Yeah, what's there to do? There's another question. So anybody know? Why isn't this thing already a snark? It's kind of, yeah, first it's not succinct, right? I mean, the proof is long, right? How do I tell you the proof? Is this, yeah. Yeah, kind of, exactly. So it, this is not really like uh, something I can send you over the network, right? How would you use this? How do you put this in a transaction, right? Either, you know, maybe you first send me via email the long proof, and then I sample it myself, but then by the time you send me the long proof, you might have well sent me X, right? Or maybe you say, oh, no, I, w I don't send you the proof. Just send me the queries first, and, and I'll send you the answers. But then I can cheat because I can pick the proof to depend on the queries, <laughs> right? So here, the way I describe things is that you write down the proof, then the queries are sampled, okay? It's important. If you first see the queries, you can just concoct some local sort of answers that are gonna make the verifier happy. What's important here is that the proof is written down. So this is absolutely not a snarg, okay? It is merely a sophisticated type of writing down X, it's not X, I mean coding of X, such that it can be sampled, okay? So it's not a snark. And what I want to communicate is how to bridge this gap, how to take something like this, which has no cryptography, it just exists, and we turn this into a snark, okay? Something that is non-interactive, it's not a protocol, okay? All right, that's the plan. Okay, so we're gonna go from a so-called PCP, a probabilistically checkable proof, to a snark, okay? So the main cryptographic tool we're gonna use is something that is called a random oracle. That's just a fancy word for talking about any cryptographic hash function, like SHA-256 or Blake or AES when you use it in hash mode. So all these sort of uh, bit twiddling, sort of uh, cute little primitives that sort of scramble bits for you, okay? That's all we're gonna use, no fancy cryptography, okay? It's just gonna be a cryptographic hash function. And with this tool alone, we're gonna take a PCP and turn it into a snark. By the way, this is also kind of uh, 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 maybe interesting to remark that uh, it is curious that only such lightweight cryptography is needed to construct snarks. Currently deployed snarks actually use much fancier cryptography. They use all kinds of public key cryptography, sort of more complex like primitives that uh, by using more structure are in fact for example, not secure against quantum computers, for example, and things like that I will describe today are you know, post-quantum resistant, for example. Anyways, that was just a uh, you know, small comment. How do we use this one? So here's the idea. So this is what we need to build, okay? So that, this is a snark, okay? So I'm just, this is a skeleton of it, and we're gonna sort of fill in inside the skeleton what's happening. So at the end of the day, we have to say what the prover does, how he spits out the tiny proof, and what the verifier does to check it. Now, the prover will, in his mind, run the PCP prover. What the PCP prover do, does, it will output a long proof, the PCP, the one that can be probabilistically checked. What the prover will do, it will commit to the proof using a so-called Merkle tree. This is just when you take a hash function and you pairwise hash the entire thing. So you kind of pairwise hash, 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 hash. At the end, you get like a tiny, you know, 256-bit root. Okay, it doesn't matter how long the thing was, it's just a hash of it, okay? It takes the root and sticks it again inside the hash function one more time. What will come out? Well, garbage. That's what the hash function does. It outputs garbage. That garbage is random. You can interpret that randomness as randomness for the verifier, okay? And then the verifier can just say, here are the queries. Now, let's just kind of stop for a moment and say, wait a second, now the prover has seen the queries. Maybe he wants to change his mind about what the proof is, to, to cheat. Yes, it's true, he could just do this again, but what if he changes the proof in any location, this will completely change the root, which will completely change the randomness. And so there will be, again, fresh queries. You see, somehow this, the way that things are chained up enforces in some way this kind of temporal constraints of the previous protocol. The prover cannot choose 
the PCP based on the queries, because the queries are derived from the PCP. Okay? So somehow the prover is simulating in his mind the verifier's message based on his sort of having committed first to the PCP. Okay, now that the um, prover knows the queries, he can just say, okay, I sh all I really need to tell the verifier is this and that and this other location. So how is he going to do it? Well, he's gonna so-called produce an authentication path for each of these leaves. Because of the tree structure in the way that we committed to the string, if he wants to reveal just you know, a certain number of locations, he can just take that leaf, take the path from the leaf to the root, and communicate the siblings of every node on that path, and send that along. Because then, the verifier, what can he do? He can just say, okay, thank you for the root, thank you for the leaf for that root, and thank you for the authentication path for it. He can just check it. Yes, it belongs to this tree. I don't need to tell you the entire PCP. I can just tell you the leaf with the authentication path. Okay, so in this way, the verifier is convinced that the queries are consistent with the root. Kind of, they were born after the um, that you know these answers are sort of belong to the to that tree. He also needs to check that if you take the root and you pass it through the hash function. You know, you get that randomness that was used, okay? And using that randomness, he can just check the answers, okay? So all we have done is to use cryptography, okay, to essentially build some sort of commitment that enables this entire interactive protocol to happen inside the prover's head. And then we only need to take this tiny transcript of what happened in the prover's head and send it off. This is the snark that is sent, and it's something you can write down. Okay? That doesn't make, make sense. Okay? Good, right? So, <clears throat> by the way, why am I going through this thing? Uh, because, you know, many people are interested in snarks and they ask me, okay, I want to learn more, you know, what do I do? You know, unfortunately, the situation is that there aren't surveys or, you know, courses about snarks. There are only academic papers dating back, you know, either recent, you know, sort of off, off, fresh off the presses, but, you know, very difficult to go through, or like also other papers, more academic, in the 90s. So it's kind of difficult to go back and just start, you know, disassembling uh, academic papers. So I want, there are some concepts that I believe are communicatable and are interesting. And so uh, uh, um, I'm here, you know, to attempt to so communicate this, I think, interesting ideas. Um, Okay, so this is a snark. Let's just double check that the proof is indeed small. Uh, what's inside the proof? Well, we have to communicate the answer to every query, so we have at least something for every query. And then we have to also give the authentication path. But notice the authentication path is small. Why? Because if you build a tree, binary tree, on top of a long string, the depth of the path is gonna be logarithmic in it, okay? So if your PCP has length poly t, your authentication path has depth log t. Okay, and overall, you know, if you ask, let's say, log t number of queries to kind of make sure your, your soundness error is very small, overall you have, you know, poly log t amount of information communicated from the prover to the verifier in one <clears throat> non-interactive message. By the way, where is the setup? Where are the system parameters? Where is the randomness that I discussed earlier? That's also, also a question. Yeah, the random oracle, it's kind of, it's a bit stronger than just a bunch of random, than, than a random string. Really, from a theoretical perspective, using a random oracle is a, you know, it's a pretty strong assumption. But in practice, it's fine. Essentially, the setup of uh, this type of snark is basically you and I agreeing that we're going to use this hash function as opposed to this other hash function, okay? So as long as we're happy to use a hash function that we don't think has been designed to cause bad, bad things to this type of constructions, we're fine. For example, Shadow 6 was designed before anybody cared about snarks, okay? So that's a pretty good choice, right? Okay, so there is a setup, but in practice, who cares, right? We can definitely agree on which hash function to use. That's much easier than running a cryptographic ceremony, okay? All right. So, at high level, uh, this uh, sort of PCP-based snarks are wonderful. Uh, first, we're using you know, really lightweight cryptography, any hash function. Second, 
In fact, they're also plausibly post-quantum. We could deploy them and, you know, sit and let them sit around for potentially a very long time, right? even if quantum computers come around. You know? Whether they do or not, and when, uh, that, that's a different story, but you know, at least we don't have to worry about it. And you know, most, most important, they're, they're transparent. So if they have all these wonderful properties, then why are we using anything else? Well, because you know, there are two sides to the slide. There's also some bad things about these things. And that is, well, from a, as a, from a theoretical perspective, using random oracles feels like a no-brainer in practice, but as a theoretician, it actually is not a very elegant thing to do. You know what? You know, forget about it. It's not really like a, a bad thing. It, that's only, you know, sort of theoretician's nightmares, but you know, you know, really in the real world, nobody really cares. So let's cross that out. The real issue is that even though this entire construction feels very lightweight and cute and simple, the problem is that uh, we're assuming, you know, this magical object of a PCP that until, you know, very recently was this kind of these galactic algorithms that, you know, sort of you start running the prover and say, oh, did it stop? Well, no, right? It will never stop. You know, it will stop at some point when the sun is cold and all these things. So they are sort of efficient in the asymptotic sense, okay? But not really like if you care about specific instance sizes. I actually personally worked a lot on uh, sort of trying to squeeze these things at least inside, say, one planet, okay? Uh, as opposed to like not the universe, but it's still not sort of quite the kind of things that we want. So PCPs have gone from galactic algorithms to things that are merely expensive, but we want things that are cheap, okay? So <clears throat> in the last few years, this is something that uh, is very close to my heart in a sense that you know, I spent you know, many hours uh, you know, with my colleagues uh, you know, sort of working on these things, is a sort of new generation of transparent snarks where we've been able to achieve you know, much better efficiency while preserving all the other good properties. Okay? At a very high level, we're going to be constructing probabilistic checkable proofs in a bigger design space. Okay? What is this bigger design space? The bigger design space is that we're going to allow the prover and the verifier to have a longer conversation. Again, this is just a model, right? It's an ideal model where they're having this conversation. Just like in the PCP model, they weren't literally having a conversation. That was just an abstraction. Then we implemented the abstraction using cryptography, right? So how, here we have this notion called interactive oracle proofs that I introduced with uh, my uh, long-time uh, collaborator Eli Ben Sasson and one of my students uh, several years ago. Essentially, you have a conversation where the prover and verifier, the verifier sends some randomness, the prover sends PCPs you know, over several rounds. And at some point, the verifier says, okay, you know, that's enough of a conversation, let me query stuff, okay, and get back answers and then check. What's the difference? This is essentially just a multi-round PCP. Now, there are two things to say about these things. It is a richer type of conversation. Can we still build snarks? That's important, right? Because then in the end, we don't actually want to have these conversations. We want to have snarks. Second, do we gain anything with these richer types of conversations? Okay. First, let me say that, you know, with a very simple, and it's going to be a quick picture, we can still compile this. At a very high level, you just do the same thing over multiple rounds. You just the prover will imagine in his head the first PCP, commit to it, stick it into the hash function to produce the next randomness, to produce the next PCP, he will commit to it, and you kind of put in a hash chain all of these PCPs. Why in a hash chain? So that they are in incorrect order. When you're done with the conversation, you get back the queries and you send back everything. And the prover you know, will again check all the authentication paths, check that all the PCP routes are in a hash chain, and check the answers. I don't want to spend too much more time on this one, but all I want to say is that essentially we can use similar ideas. It's a little bit more subtle than this. We can use similar ideas, lightweight cryptography, to still construct snarks. Okay, fine. That's, that means that this richer design space still implies something that we care about. So we, we have all of the good things as before, and just like before, we have this random oracle, but we don't care. The great thing is that over the past few years, we've had lots of uh, a, sort of uh, a, a new ideas and discoveries whereby we have shown that uh, this notion of interactive oracle proofs or multi-round PCPs are really not that expensive. They're in fact much faster, more efficient than PCPs. And <clears throat> 
Over the last few, few years alone, we've had this, I uh, think, you know, very exciting interplay between asymptotic improvements and concrete efficiency improvements, where you know, new theoretical ideas give you, you know, new asymptotics, and you say, wait, you know, that, that's, this new tool is actually very exciting for actually building a system. While you build a system, you come up with interesting ideas that help the asymptotics. It's been a very exciting sort of uh, a, a back and forth between theory and practice. But it, at the end of the day, you get this improved IOP-based sort of transparent SNARGs. And from, in terms of numbers, if we just, for example, look at the proof size, if merely like two years ago we were looking at proofs that were asymptotically short but concretely pretty long, like tens of megabytes, today we have proofs for arbitrary computations that are, you know, 200 kilobytes long, okay, for any computation. And in each of these, uh, it doesn't really matter what's on the right of the, 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 the column, I just wanted to emphasize that each of these concrete efficiency improvements was associated to a particular new idea that was first and foremost theoretical. Okay, that somehow understanding better this tool, how it behaves from a theoretical perspective had direct impact in how good of proofs we could construct, how efficient of proofs we could cons construct. So, and uh, you know, just sounds like a theoretician speaking, so let me put a graph to prove that you know, this thing is actually implemented and we can measure things and we know what's happening. In fact, this type of exciting progress is exactly what has motivated uh, uh, um, you know, uh, my colleagues and I to, to start uh, uh, a company last year to uh, commercialize uh, uh, these exciting developments uh, in cryptography proofs to bring so these transparent SNARKs, you know, to do scale, uh, applications having to do with scalability and privacy in a peer-to-peer -peer setting, okay? All right. So the main takeaways that, you know, from today is, uh, well, first, you know what is a succinct argument. That's, that's a good thing. And more importantly, the uh, research on transparent SNARKs has progressed a lot just in the last few years and have become really short, okay? It's not the case anymore that... Uh, things based on probabilistically checkable proofs are sort of inefficient. That's uh, uh, kind of to some extent still true, but we have other tools today to do the same job. Uh, I should also say that this doesn't mean that these tools are sort of the best tools out there. That's absolutely not the case. If you are willing to use public key cryptography, for example, you can do much better. So for example, if you have a trusted setup, you can get 128 bytes. That's like much smaller than a tweet, okay? You have to put up system parameters. Or even without system parameters, there's a beautiful work called Bulletproofs that achieves two kilobytes. That's 100 times smaller than 200 kilobytes. But you're using public cryptography, so it really depends what you're trying to do, okay? Do you want something lightweight, post-quantum, or not? So there's a, it's, if you kind of start digging deep into the cryptograph cryptographic proof literature, there's many exciting things to learn about. Uh, either way, transparent SNARKs obtained from IOPs, you know, give you this uh, sort of fully succinct verification that in many of these proof systems, alternative ones, you cannot, you just get a short proof, but not a short verifier. Here we get both. And, you know, the main point is that you can really only use lightweight crypto. You can basically bring things very close to metal and really speed them up. It's really hard, easy to kind of speed things up in hardware. Wow, I'm, I'm, I have 28 seconds left on my timer. <laughs> And that's just about what I wanted to say. I'm happy today if you learned something about SNARKs. That's really what I wanted to achieve today. Thank you for coming. Thanks.